Good morning. I feel like I'm interrupting recess. And I feel bad about that, but I'm excited to have a chance to welcome you this morning to the Library of Congress. I'm Liam Potter. I direct the Office of Learning and Innovation here. And it really is my pleasure to welcome you this morning on this beautiful spring day. I think the stars must be aligned because it is a perfect spring morning to be here in Washington. So you guys are charmed. As you know, today we're here for our symposium first on diversity in children's literature, followed by the Walter Awards. The program this morning is entitled Read, Discover, Grow, and it is being co-hosted by both the library and We Need Diverse Books. I think we need to do a good shout out to We Need Diverse Books. As most of you know, We Need Diverse Books is a nonprofit organization whose aim is to help produce and promote literature that reflects and honors the lives of all young people. Yay. This program is being live streamed, so if you want to do a shout out to, you know, your nieces and nephews and children and sisters and brothers, now's your chance. Go ahead and wave. Oh, you know, when I do that with kids, they get all over it. <laughs> just, just saying. Um, I do want to thank our audience at a distance for joining us as well, especially those in time zones other than ours. You know, for those folks in uh, the mountain time zone and uh, on the West Coast, it's a really early morning for them. So thanks to those at a distance. Thank you as well to colleagues who are in this room who are making this live stream happen and making this recording happen. Um, magic like that doesn't happen by itself. So thank you, guys. Um, I'm excited to introduce this morning's panel moderator, um, but before I do, I have to tell you a little short story. Um, my parents think it's horrible that I no longer subscribe to a regular daily newspaper. So when they come to visit, they make sure that the Wall Street Journal weekend edition is at my house. And so they've now gotten us a subscription to the weekend edition of the journal, so it's always there. And I'm happy to report I've gotten into the habit of reading it every Saturday morning, especially the review section. And I happen to have my little cutout here of the Wall Street Journal review section from February 2nd of this year. And I, this is where my story comes in. So on that Saturday, February 2nd, while reading the review section of the journal, I came across an article entitled Handing Out the Hardware. In it, I read the following. Each year, the Newbery Medal goes to the book considered by the selection committee to be the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. This year, it went to Meg Medina's kind-hearted novel for nine to 12-year-olds, Mercy Suarez Changes Gears. Although the article continued, I simply squealed and shouted for the rest of my family to hear, hey, I know her, this is cool. <laughs> Um, and it is cool. Meg Medina is a good friend to the library, and I am glad that my path has crossed with hers a number of, on a number of occasions. She is the 2019 John Newberry Medal recipient. She is also a Cuban-American author who writes picture books, middle grade, and young adult fiction. Her YA novels include Burn, Baby, Burn, and The Girl Who Silenced the Wind. Her picture books include Mango, Abuela, and Me, and Tia Isa Wants a Car. Meg's works have been called heartbreaking, lyrical, and must-haves for every collection. In addition to the Newberry, they have earned her the Pura Belpri Medal and Honors and Ezra Jack Keats Award. Meg's works have also been longlisted for the National Book Award and were twice named as finalists for the prestigious Kirkus Prize for Young People's Fiction. Her work examines how cultures intersect as seen through the eyes of young people. When she's not writing, Meg works on community projects that support girls, Latino youth, and or literacy. She lives with her family in Richmond, Virginia. Please join me in welcoming Meg Medina, who will be serving as our panel moderator.
Buenos dias. It's so nice to be here this morning, and I want to call up my friends to join me um, today. Thank you very much for that welcome. And hi, everybody at home and on the West Coast, and welcome to the young people who are with us today. Um, I have very short bios. You're going to hear more about these exquisite people in a moment. But for now, when I um, call you, just come on up, please. The first person is Tiffany Jackson. Tiffany is the author of the critically acclaimed Allegedly and Monday's Not Coming, which recently won the Coretta Scott King John Steptoe New Talent Award. <laughs> A TV professional by day, um, novelist by night. We have to talk about this. Um, she received her BA from Howard University and her MA in Media Studies from the New School. Woo! Next up. Emily XR Pan. <laughs> Emily is the New York Times bestselling author of a book I love, The Astonishing Color of After, which was a finalist also for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Oh, um, <laughs> long listed for the Carnegie Medal, uh, Medal and um, I'm sorry, and she was the recipient of the Apala Honor Award. Emily currently lives in Brooklyn, New York, but was originally from the Midwest um, and born to immigrant parents from Taiwan. Next up, mi amigo, David Bowles. Come on up. <laughs> David is a Mexican-American author from South Texas, where he teaches at the University of Texas, Rio Grande uh, Valley. His books have received the Pura Bel Pre honor and have been included on Kirkus Best YA Books 2018. And last but definitely not least, Vera Haranandani. <laughs> Vera is the author of The Night Diary, which received a Newbery Honor um, this year and the 2018 Malka Penn Award for Human Rights in Children's Literature. She's a former book editor at Simon & Schuster, and she now teaches creative writing at Sarah Lawrence College Writing Institute. Please give them all a big round. So this is how it's going to work, people. I don't like podiums, so I am going to go sit with my friends, and we are going to have a chat. Um, I have given them a sneak peek into questions, but the idea is for us to interrupt each other, to add to each other's comments, to take us on wild excursions away from these questions. Um, you know, it's free-flowing. And I think they're game because they're all book people and they love us, so I say we're in, OK? All right, here I go. <laughs> Okay, is my mic on? You can hear me? Okay, so the first thing I was curious about, um, because all of your novels um, were, had such voice, all of them. We have a novel about a girl um, in part at the time of partition writing a diary to her mom who's no longer living. We have a boy trying to make sense of his life and his family and his identity. We have a girl struggling with her mother's suicide. We have a story of a girl trying to make sense and discover the reasons behind the disappearance of a dear friend. And what came across to me for all of them is just the sense of voice. So I think the first thing I want to ask you is, for you in your novels, where did you find this person that was going to lead that novel? Where was your protagonist? How did you find them? Um, did you find story first or the person first? Give us some sense of that. And I'm going to pick on. Poor Tiffany. You were close. She was like, no, no, not me, not me. I was secretly trying to say it with my eyes, like, no. Don't do it, Nick. Don't do it. Um, so the main protagonist in Monday's Not Coming, uh, her name is Claudia. And she honestly, I sort of dialed into myself, um, me as a child. I was a relatively a shy child. Um, I had a best friend that I didn't really want to share with anyone. I still don't like to share my toys today. Um, 
I also had a learning disability and I, I lived in my own bubble. So it was really actually easy for me to write something like this because it was easy for me to just dial into my own personal experiences um, to find that kid that I pretended not to be, but I truly was when I look back on her. Huh. Anybody else, where did you find your people? For me, the st I started with the story, which is, I know, very odd because the book is so character driven. Mm -hmm. um, but I knew that I wanted to write uh, about a girl who was hearing her grandmother's stories for the first time because the grandmother in my book is shamelessly ripped off of my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> like, basically, copy, paste. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to, I, I had this gap of this character to fill, and then it took me many years to start to dive into myself. It took me a really long time to be willing to go there, I think I was really afraid at first. I think in the beginning, I was like, oh, I'm gonna write about this totally fictional person completely different from me because you know, I didn't wanna like dig up shadows and explore all these things that were conflicts in my brain, were, were things that I was trying to wrestle with myself. And so that was an interesting process. I wrote many, many drafts and finally arrived at a place where I was like, oh, I have to, I have to talk about me and my experience with my family and what it felt like to straddle different identities growing up. So that was the thing that was keeping you, that notion of um, identity and, and fear, was that, am I hearing that right? Yeah, I mean, in original drafts of the book, my character was very, very, every single time I rewrote the book, it was a completely different cast of characters except for the grandmother's character because she was my grandmother. Emily, but, that's a lot of pages. <laughs> it is a lot of pages and a lot of characters. Okay. <laughs> and then when I finally landed upon Lee's character, it became this way of expressing and exploring all these things that I didn't even realize I was still wrestling with from my childhood of like, you know, not quite fitting into this culture and not quite fitting into that culture mm -hmm. and trying to find my place in the world. And how about El Güero? Yeah. So yeah, well, um, They Call Me Güero didn't really begin as a novel in verse. It was originally meant to be kind of like a character study, a collection of poems in a boy's voice just to, to get across the complexity of the Mexican-American identity and, and try to break with a lot of the stereotypes and push back against some of the, the, the noise that we hear in society right now. Um, the, the first poem I wrote was, it was even before I had thought of the idea of the book, it was a poem called Border Kid that was commissioned by Janet Wong and Sylvia Vardell for an anthology they did right after the election that kind of helped kids uh, of color who were kind of distraught about the, the things they were hearing the leaders of our country saying to grapple with their, their anxiety through poetry. And so I, I wrote this poem called Border Kid and um, it was reprinted in the Journal of Children's Literature and then I read it when I was inducted into the Texas Institute of Letters. And as I was coming down off the stage, an editor came up to me and said, I love that poem and if you can write another 50 poems in that kid's voice, <laughs> I'll publish it. So. I was like, I, that was not on my writing calendar, but, but so I, I sat down and started trying to find out who this kid was, um, and I realized that while uh, his identity intersected with mine, he was also partly my son, partly the, the boys that I had taught when I was a, a middle school teacher for nine years, partly just the other, my cousins and you know, other muchachos traviesos of, of the area. And you know, bit by bit, this, this complex, real human character just blossomed. And I, after a while, I could hear his voice so clearly that the poems just like, came naturally, just poured out of me. It was, it's, it's a gift when that happens. Um, and, and that's, the was kind of an amalgamation of all these wonderful things about being a Mexican-American boy on the border, um, unique, a, you know, a Gen Z kid who's kind of a nerd. He's travieso, he's mischievous, he gets in trouble with his friends, but he's got a good heart. He doesn't mean any, any real malice by it. Um, he's beginning to fall in love for the first time, and, and he's deeply rooted in this community, but he's a Mexican-American kid in 2019, so he's also grappling with like, all kinds of bullying at the local level and at the national level as well. And poetry, he finds poetry. He has a teacher who helps him to discover it and he finds his voice, and I found his voice, and that's, it's nice for that it's to happen. It's a good thing, because yeah. 50 poems yeah. is hard to write without, without a voice. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> he came I mean, through. you can, but it's it's came through. robotic and boring, right? Evira, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, it, that idea of sort of finding your voice and finding 
your character's voice, and it's sort of two different, and then your character finding their voice. Mm -hmm. There are all these layers of voice, I feel like, that you're kind of unearthing. And I started um, The Night Diary kind of really way back, and I knew that I wanted to write a story about the 1947 partition of India. I wanted it to be inspired by my own father's experiences and my father's family's experiences, but I really wasn't sure how to access it. Um, and so, you know, I, I started actually with a, a young male character, and I was just like in third person, my very early sketches. And as I was, I was kind of writing pieces, I realized I was trying to write my father's story, which is not really what I wanted to do. I wanted it to have that connection, um, but I also needed a more personal connection with the main character. Um, and so I sort of moved that male character over, and Nisha kind of blossomed, the main character, and I knew that somehow she was very quiet, very shy, um, and would have trouble talking to people outside of her family, um, but she would be able to express herself in a diary and find her voice that way. And then creating Nisha, writing in her diary, helped me figure out kind of my voice for the book and her voice, and then her finding her voice. So all of those layers. Yeah, which brings us, I was thinking also about just the form, the way you guys, um, decided to tell your story, because that's a, that's a thing, right? You're sitting there and you could say, you could tell the same story in so many ways. So in your case, it's an epistolary novel. You, you're telling it through a diary. So uh, you guys played with time, uh, sometimes chronology, sometimes magical realism. How, how did you decide on your form? Like, what's, did that, I, I hear now how Vera did it, but how about the rest of you? Did you, uh, was that conscious? Did you experiment with other ways of telling this story? Or did it flow pretty much from the beginning? You're looking at me again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You'll forgive me one day, <laughs> Tiffany. So, um, so Monday's Not Coming is told in a series of befores and afters. So it's before Monday, the, um, call you his best friend, before Monday, as disappearance and after. And I did that honestly uh, for a threefold reason. One, I really wanted everyone to get to know Monday and Claudia. I wanted them to get to know their relationship. I wanted them to see it build and see it blossom and see how best friends could really love each other. And two, or a second reason, is I didn't want, specifically because I write thrillers. Um, and if you notice a lot of thrillers, there's always sort of like a dead girl in the background and she's not really talked about. And I didn't want Monday to be just another dead girl. I wanted her to actually like really thrive on the page, for you to really get to know her. So whenever the outcome of the story is, you're more affected by it because you know the girl. It's not just like you know a phantom person. Three, I really wanted this story to be an experience. So I wanted, of course it seems like the chapters are sort of all over the place, but that's exactly how Claudia was feeling. She was, disturbed, she was frustrated, she was confused, um, she was dealing with her own learning disabilities, she was dealing with the fact that she had a best friend that was missing and felt like no one else seemed to acknowledge that. So I wanted her feelings to really, I wanted the reader's feelings to parallel Claudia's feelings. So that was sort of like, it was sort of a threefold, like kind of, yeah. you know, a mixed stew there. It the, was challenging though, the, the time, manipulating time that way. Oh yeah, It was Girl. tricky. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, and to be honest, I didn't originally write it that way. I actually wrote it in chronological order. And then of course, like many of my books, I come up with an idea out of nowhere. And I woke up at two o'clock in the morning and I was like, oh, oh, we should do it this way. And that's literally what I did. And honestly, the only reason why I was able to even remotely do it and not completely drive myself crazy is because I do have a film background. So I take every chapter and I consider it like a scene. So I was able to rearrange everything just like you would do in an edit room. And that was the only way. So when people are like, oh, teach me how to do this, I was like, mm -hmm. right. <laughs> get a media degree. <laughs> That was actually one of my questions also that I wanted to range on was all of you have these colorful, incredible backgrounds, professional backgrounds, like you've done other stuff, TV. Um, but you know, Vera was an editor, David's a professor. And so like, I, I'm wondering like, how do your past experiences 
how did they help shape how you attack maybe the structure of the novel and so on? So I see cer certainly the film part of it and how you would tell a story like this. And to say that you write a thriller is like the biggest understatement. <laughs> I, re I read this book like, you know, <laughs> in terror, basically. Um, <laughs> so just be warned. Um, but I definitely saw that. So how do your past experiences, how did it help you tell it in, in terms of how you picked the form? And I feel like you just made the question so much harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm Every, tricky everybody, that way. Everyone on this end had I'm already prepared I'm tricky to that way. Yeah, we like, always, whoever wants we to jump in, <laughs> you can be brave. You can be brave. I, I mean, my background is kind of all over the place, and I feel like my book is kind of all over the place. So, good. See what, I, see what I did there. I, <laughs> um, I wish I could write like a, a book that's linear chronology, start to finish. I think my life would be so much easier. Mm. Um, but I start writing. And then I immediately get bored, and I gotta throw a wrench into things, and then I gotta throw another wrench into things, and then suddenly I'm juggling multiple timelines, and I'm like, what's going on? And, um, yeah. And I, for me, it was also that uh, I, I sort of hinted upon how I, I do iterative drafting. So uh, my drafts tend to look hugely different from previous drafts. And so when we sold, when my agent and I sold the book, it actually was more of a fantasy novel. It like cut back and forth between a fantasy world and the real world, and it was all braided together, and then there were different timelines within those also. And then I realized the fantasy world really wasn't working the way I wanted it to. It, it sort of took the weight out of the story I was really trying to tell, and so I ended up stripping that entirely out of the book but I still needed to somehow be able to access memories from the past because in the book, uh, Lee gets um, these memories that belong to other people that, that she couldn't have gotten any other way except via magical means. And so through that, the need to fill that kind of guided my, my timeline and my jumping around. And then I ended up with, you know, also a big stew. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big fans of stew up stew. here. We but like it's, food. it's fun to see how it, how it all works. How about you guys? Yeah, well, um, you know, as somebody who was an English teacher for 14 years, and uh, after I got my doctorate, I was in charge of an English language arts program and, and an ESL bilingual program in an entire school district, and now I'm teaching at the university. When I when the idea came for me to write a bunch of poems in this kid's voice, I started thinking as a teacher, well, what do teachers need from a book of middle grade poetry? What, what would they like to have? <laughs> you know, they've got to teach like all these, all these different forms and all these different like, you know, elements of prosody. So maybe I can have him like playing around with formal poetry because so, much, so many novels in verse are going to be written in free verse. I was like, let me do something a little bit different. And so before I even knew it was going to be a novel in verse, I, I had him experimenting with writing a sonnet, with writing, you know, different types of, of like more metered poetry and so forth. And there, in the, the collection was broken up into sections, an in initial chronological section that was a little more free verse. And and then sections where he's experimenting with different forms and writing about celebrations and people in his family and so forth. Um, and as I was writing all this, it, it was really, really a lot of fun. But you know, I handed off the rough draft to my editor, and he's like, "Well, this is you know a great this exercise in you know <laughs> in creating a textbook or something." But <laughs> But you oh, you got to stop thinking about the teachers and thinking about the <laughs> students, clearly. Um, and, and then he was the one who showed me, look, there's obviously a narrative thread here, a, a, a story that wants to be told. Rearrange all this stuff in chronological order and let's take a look at it and see where the gaps are and start filling those in. Um, and he started making suggestions for changes to some of the poems or things for me to think about that would that were disrupting, you know, whatever form the poem was being written in. So ha some of the poems are now like weird fusions of an original like formal poem mm. and then some like free verse elements. Um, I'm very happy with the, the final thing, but you know, when you go into it thinking, oh, I want to make something you know, that's, that has utility for teachers, um, it doesn't always turn out quite the way yeah. um, <laughs> students are going to be happy with. And, and I think this is we we've we've found a place in the middle that is going to be 
exciting and fun and meaningful and that for students it will resonate with them, be a mirror for Latinx kids, be a window into Mexican American culture for others, but that also teachers will be like, oh, there's a sonnet in this book. That's awesome. Yeah, the war I, th I think the warning is always like you can't, the moment you start writing for the adults, and if you're a children's author yep. or yeah. a YA author, the moment you start considering what the adults are going to think, say, you're a goner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, don't do it. What do you think? Now, you're the editor, so I'm really feeling like, wowza. Wasn't that great an editor? No. Um, <laughs> no I, the I truth comes that, out. Oh okay, this no. is my route into writing. I wasn't a good line editor. I'm not incredibly detail-oriented that way. I'm much better, and I teach writing, too. So I've always been on kind of different sides. I've been a writing student, a writing teacher, a writer, an editor. So I sort of know how all those different places feel. So I think it gives me... a fluidity of, you know, with drafts and having that conversation with your editor, I, I really never attach myself to whatever draft it is, and I know that it's going to change. I want it to change. I want to hear that other input. I'm actually a really linear writer, so I can get a little constrained. Like, I almost wish I could kind of jump around here and jump around there. So I, I often give myself some kind of limit in my writing, like the diary format or a point of view that I can kind of come up against as a, as a problem. Um, like, how do I tell a whole story in a diary? And will people be OK with me taking the leap, um, the main character kind of maybe filling out more of a narrative in the diary um, that maybe a 12-year-old would actually write in their diary. And so I do, there were times where I knew I was going to make that leap. But then there were times where I really had to, and then, you know, just through drafts, like, that's too much. You're really writing something else. You're not, you're not writing a, a diary entry anymore. But I like to have those walls to kind of hit against and it, you know, and then make choices yeah. about them. Yeah, Here, I, I feel like I go back into my life as a oh, Yeah, like you can give me the the linear parts, and I'll I'll give you my jumping around parts. <laughs> <laughs> sure. After the panel, we'll do that. <laughs> the the consciousness transfer machine is in back. <laughs> Stop you. I feel like I go back into my teaching life. Um, mm -hmm. For mercy, I did that, and I I feel like people ask you like, what did you do before you were a writer and things like that, and I feel like. Everything you've done in your whole life makes you a writer. I don't know if you feel that way, but I yeah. feel like it all um, cooks into the person yeah. who creates. Um, all right, because we're here certainly um, in honor of We Need Diverse Books, I want to talk about how we write the nuanced stories of our communities. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about how we talk about the difficulties um, for kids in our communities, and also the, both the, the hardship, the less flattering parts of our communities. Like, how is it that you approach that in your work? And I'm going to give you a break, Tiffany, because yeah, she's like, I can feel the terror coming off the woman. It's coming right through. Let me think. So I'm, I'm going to put Emily on the spot this time. Yeah. I know, you see, they feel so bad for you. <laughs> I think it's really a matter of being honest. Mm. Um, I think it's that, you know, I, I feel like when I, 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 I've considered myself a storyteller for pretty much most of my life. And, you know, when you, when you first start out your, your early novels, you're trying to, you try to write these like perfect characters who are, who are like the Disney-fied version of, you know, maybe yourself or, or some, some imagining in your head of like that perfect unicorn human who does everything exactly right. right. Yeah. And that's not actually interesting to read. And as you develop as a writer, for, for me, it was about challenging myself to put the faults on the page, to find those flaws, to examine them and, and see how they actually make us more human and more interesting, um, and to put mistakes on the page. And then, and then kind of like I was saying earlier about how it took me so long to find the character for The Astonishing Color of After, I had to be willing to delve into things that were difficult to talk about and think about. Um, I, and the, the ugly parts of my experiences growing up, not just the fun things, but, you know, like... 
um, dealing with microaggressions and dealing with never feeling like enough, never feeling Asian enough, never feeling American enough. And I think it just really became about capturing that truth as respectfully as possible. And also doing my due diligence because we inevitably all hold our own biases. And yeah. so I, I interviewed a lot of people to write uh, The Astonishing Color of After. I, I generally interview a lot of people for anything that I write to try to understand things from all sorts of different sides, to try to understand where my brain might be fixated on something because of how I was raised or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's really wise, especially, and I know this is the incredibly, The Astonishing Color of After is a debut novel which is just yeah. a glorious, gorgeous thing. debut. It's just too. glorious achievement. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I very much hear that notion of humility when we approach our work and that we can get things wrong um, ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, about our own communities mm -hmm. even. So um, it's funny because it's such a struggle right now in our community at large in publishing, right? Yeah. Who gets to write what, who's, but you know, we're all being held to that standard. Even we are holding ourselves to No, I think um, um, it was Daniel Jose Oldham that, whose comment I read a couple years ago and they were talking about diversity. He goes, I look forward to the, the day when we don't have to use the word diversity anymore, when, when work just reflects reality. And so um, when I set out to write about a Mexican American boy in the Mexican American community in the, the Valley, it was really important to me to be honest and, and reflect the world as it truly is. I mean, obviously it's a fictionalized version of things, but, um, and as the title suggests, they call me Güero. For those of you who are not familiar with Mexican Spanish, Güero means a white-coated, light-skinned uh, Mexican-American. Um, and at the core of the book is Güero's coming to realize that as the most light-skinned person in his family, he is the most privileged of the family. Um, and and like, you know, pushing back against that the way any 12-year-old kid would because he also feels part of a community that's a community of color. And so even though he is a white Latino, he belongs to a community of color. And so he's in this weird liminal space um, where, when, for example, when um, his sister Teresa, who's a basketball player, her team gets to go away um, as part of the champions to a, a, a faraway town in another part of Texas that is uh, not as brown as South Texas. As you guys will undoubtedly realize, Texas um, has many spots that are redder and whiter. Um, <laughs> they, the fans of the opposing team start with a chant that was just basically ripped from the headlines of, you know, go back to Mexico, build that wall. And so suddenly, Guero, who is often singled out for being light-skinned and, and red-haired and with colored eyes and freckles and stuff like that, suddenly has to, suddenly is definitely part of this, this solidarity that comes, you know, from being attacked as a community. Um, and at that moment, he even though he isn't, strictly speaking, a child of color, he is a child of color because he's part of a community of color. And it's this, that, that weird, uh, um, you know, nepantla, as Gloria Ansaldúa called it, that liminal space that in between, where your identity is neither one nor the other. Um, you, you know, when it's convenient for certain people, you can be seen as white, but the minute you're, you're your Latina identity comes to the forefront, you're no longer white. And th I wanted to grapple with that. And so to show the colorism within his own community, the way he's both treated better and sometimes, um, you know, hated upon for being light skinned and also like the way his community is having to grapple with what's being pushed on them in 2019. Yeah, I really understand that idea of being in between um, and not really knowing what community you belong in, um, and that's something I, I try to bring to all my work, and my mother it was born here, and she's Jewish, and my father was born in India, and he's Hindu. Um, and so I really struggled with The Night Diary because I was writing a girl um, who, first of all, went through the partition in 1947, and I did not um, go through that. Um, so of course I talked to a lot of people and I talked to my father, which was an incredible opportunity to be able to talk to him about, you know, I would sit down and say, okay, dad, you know, everything you remember, all the little details that you think aren't important, tell me. Um, but then I talked to a lot of family members and I listened to a lot of oral testimonies um, collected in books and online. Um, but I, I did ask myself the question, 
am I supposed to write, can I write this? Is this too much of a leap? And I come from an interfaith family, but my main character is Hindu and Muslim because I wanted her to um, ask a lot of questions about why those groups were in uh, conflict during that time. So I wanted her to really, when her country is being torn apart and com her community is being torn apart and she has these multiple identities, where does she belong? And I certainly could relate to it in a very, a deeply personal level because I'm, I, my whole life I feel like I've been managing multiple identities and asking the question, where do I belong? And I've, I've found that it really has become my muse. It's really, um, really interesting, rich, complicated place to live, kind of in between. So I put that sort of in between in all of my characters and all of my work, but it's gonna manifest itself differently. But I do look for that place, where can I truly, personally, deeply connect to this story? And then it's gonna blossom and have a life of its own. And then when I am going more outside of myself, I sort of okay, I'm, I'm, I'm writing more outside of myself now. What do I need? What kind of help do I need? What kind of research do I need to do? Um, how do I sort of respect this decision in this moment in the book? So. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the character Monday, she, uh, so the book, if some of you don't know, the book takes place here in, uh, in DC, in Southeast DC specifically. And the character Monday lives in a community called Edboro. Now Edboro actually, if you read context clues and you're from here, Edboro is actually a community called Berry Farms. Berry Farms is, or was, a notorious housing project that was at some point saturated with crime and has been recently sold off to developers to basically wipe out an entire community and rebuild. So it's gentrification like, you know, on speed dial. Um, on speed, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> can't, really call, can't really call gentrification, but you kind of can. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so when I was first writing Monday's Not Coming, uh, there was a lot of protests, a lot of activists, a lot of people trying to, you know, stop this development from happening, stopping people from evicting an entire community that's been there since the land was first bought for free slaves. So that was literally the only thing in this book that I had changed. I only changed that. I only changed the name of Berry Farms to Edboro to basically kind of not put any more spotlight and any negative sort of spotlight onto the community. Um, and I didn't want to taint, you know, what they were trying to do as well too. And that's sort of like, you know, one of the harder parts about writing about quote unquote rough areas like project houses because when, you, when people hear the projects they immediately think like the hood and that's never been my you know, initial thought when I think of you know, housing projects stuff like that, I think of communities, I think of families. Like some of my favorite memories have been at my aunt's house. So there is very a delicate balance between perpetuating stereotypes and telling the truth mm -hmm. and actually diving through that truth and seeing kind of like the color and the beauty of a community like that. Like right now, this day, there are only three families left in Berry Farms out of 444, like almost like 500 families, mm -hmm. which is insane. And that was something that I also had to grapple with in terms of while writing this book as well too, is like knowing that, you know, someone's gonna read this book next year and not know what the hell Barry Farms was even right. was. So there was really much a delicate balance of that. And also the balance of like, you know, we weren't loud enough when all this was happening. Like we didn't have people like say like, no, this is wrong. You cannot evict all these families and displace them. Like this is wrong. And that's one of the things that, you know, we as a black community, we tend to be very private about things. You know, we don't like to talk about like the ugly. We like to deal with it in our own ways in a lot of ways. And so I think that that was something that I also wanted to bring to the forefront as well too, is like talk about the fact that, you know, when things are going bad, like we are dealing with a lot of mental health issues and we can't just erase it by, you know, praying about it. We should talk to people about it. We should raise our voices about it. So I think that that was something that I, and I knew that I was probably gonna get a lot of slack for it in a way, because um, I was you know, sort of exposing a little bit of dirty laundry at the same time. Um, but I thought it was important. And so you know, I'll take the hits if I know that it's gonna help our community heal yeah. 
and sort of erase sort of the stereotypes of what housing projects could be like as well too. I feel the, the weight of the dirty laundry thing too when I'm writing about sometimes machismo or uh, yeah. family violence, like those kinds of things I feel like. Um, but I'm with Emily and, and with all of you, just like the push of the truth feels like more urgent to me. Yeah. So let's talk about um, writing really hard emotional truths for children because that takes a lot of thinking. Yeah. Right? It takes a lot of thinking and it takes a lot of consideration of who the children are, how old they are, like all of that. What do you, what do you think? How, how do you approach that? Because I mean, think of the subjects that we have here, right? Yeah. We have um, adults murdering each other. We have a mom's suicide. We have the loss of a friend. Um, we have grappling with like deep identity. Who am I yeah. if I don't look like my family, who am I? So how do we write these painful things? What are the kinds of questions you ask yourself when you're gonna write something that's, that's violent, that's hard, that's true? Uh, I typically, so I'm kind of known for uh, <laughs> gut punching people uh, with my stories, uh, to put it very lightly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, because I always, I feel that we grossly underestimate what kids can handle as far as pain, as far as like what they are able to, you know, absorb. But at the end of the day, you know, I feel like it's more urgent for us to do that. When I think of writing stories, I wanna write raw stories. I wanna write stories that really like, you know, stick with you. Like you always remember the first time you got hit. I mean, I do. So <laughs> I feel like that's something that you remember that story. You don't want that story to really like leave the person's head. Mm -hmm. I want my stories to be raw. I want the plot twist to be forever in all of my books so that kids remember those lessons. So that in a couple years when kids are in voting booths, I want them to be thinking and they have to vote on like a proposition that's going to erase an entire community. Mm -hmm. I want them to remember Monday and Berry Farms and everything that happened in Monday's Not Coming. So I personally feel like I don't, not that I don't care, about how emotionally triggering the book could be, but I also feel like there's an urgency to fix other things that matter more than anything else. What do you guys think? <laughs> yeah. Totally. I, I agree with, I, I think it's, it's really dangerous to, to start off going, oh, I, I need to protect the kids because the kids are grappling with stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember when I was that age and the kinds of stuff that I had to grapple with and I remember what it was like for my dad to abandon us and like the, the devastation you feel after that. Um, and so like I deliberately try to tap into the things, like I just feel, especially when writing for, you know, like upper middle grade and YA, if, if, there, if, if writing the book, if I do not break down weeping several times writing the book, then I'm not doing my job because I, I need mm. to tap into something that's so raw and vibrant that I can put it across. And then, you know, then you, you layer a little bit of protection for the kids so that they're not being, you know, slammed with it like so brutally, but you want that emotion to be there because they can tell the difference. They know when you're just writing something superficially to get a paycheck and, and <laughs> get on the bestseller list or when you're writing something that is meaningful and you're trying to tr transmit your own um, deeply felt um, trauma or emotion or joy or whatever the emotion happens to be, right, um, to them. And uh, when a lot of people, uh, I remember Ana Mariano um, adding me on Twitter because she was wrapping up the book and she loved it, loved it, loved it, and she read the book about the boy's dog. And she was like, why would you do this to me? <laughs> but because every child experiences the death of a pet. And it's a lot of times for kids, it's the very first time that they, that they have to grapple with that. And I remember my dog dying when I was seven and how I was just, I, I, was, I was so hurt and so like, you know, you're being faced with this darkness that exists all around you um, and you're not ready for it, but the world thrusts it on you. And I think it's kind of like, you know, incumbent on us to be the person that holds the kid's hand and says, look, there's darkness, you need to see it, but I'm gonna walk with you mm -hmm. um, and we're gonna look at it together so that you, you know that, that you're not alone in this. And uh, if we can put that across, I think it's really important. And how about, how about with yours, Emily? Because it, you know, it deals with the parental suicide. 
So, and I'm, I'm thinking about the word triggers, I'm thinking of all of those things. Like, how did you, did, what were you thinking about when you were writing those scenes and that reality? Like, were you thinking about the reader or were you completely immersed in story? How did, how did you do that? It's tricky because I, when I sat down in front of the yet again blank screen, January 2nd, 2015, um, <laughs> literally rewriting the book from scratch again, I, I didn't know what I was setting out to write. And um, the opening pages of the book poured out of me. I always talk about how it was kind of like a fugue state. And I've, I think I've like hammered home the point now that I rewrite things over and over and over again. Those opening pages are like the only pages in the book that have been so preserved since that first yeah. draft. And in the, in the opening, it, it starts with Lee, um, you know, seeing that her mother has died by suicide. And I, I, did, I honestly did not set out to write a book about suicide or a book about depression, but I had lost my aunt to suicide the year before and I couldn't stop thinking about it. And kind of going back to what you were saying with like kids dealing with grief, the, the first time I lost someone, I was eight years old. My grandfather, my paternal grandfather passed away like eight days before my birthday and my parents didn't tell me for a whole month Oh uh, because they didn't want to ruin my birthday. And then they also said, but you don't need to be upset when they finally told me. So it was all, <laughs> this is a pattern in my family. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> they just deal with death in this really weird way. When my, when my childhood dog passed away, which was um, just a handful of years ago, my parents also like didn't tell me until our like nightly phone call because I'm one of those people who calls my parents every day. So like at night I call them and they're oh, like, oh, like, like look that. this, like this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like one of those codependent only children. <laughs> so like, anyway, we can, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> and so like they, they didn't tell me until nighttime that like they had taken my, my dog to be put down that morning. And when I found out that my aunt died, it was again like, like at midnight, I called. My, I was like, oh crap, I gotta call my parents. They're gonna be going to bed soon. And my dad let me go through my whole ramble of all the mundane things happening in my life before he was like, there's some sad news. Your aunt passed this morning. And I was like, WTF. Yeah. Like, like, how is this family so unhealthy about grief? And then, and then they did the whole song and dance of like, you don't need to burden yourself. And I was like, what's wrong with you? Like of all my extended family members, yeah. she's the one that I actually felt the closest to. And so it was this, for me, when I was writing, sorry, this is a long winded answer. <laughs> so yeah. when, I was, when I was writing, it was like, I was trying to grapple with a lot of things. I was trying to grapple with all these things that I'd sort of shelved, it took me until I got to college to understand that the way I had grown up was abnormal. That the way depression takes up so much space in a house, that, that the things that were my concerns as I was growing up were not the concerns of m many other kids around me. Mm -hmm. And so when I was writing the book, the first draft was really me writing purely for myself. And it was, as I delved into, it took me until draft three to be like, oh, I gotta like look depression head on. I gotta talk about suicide. I gotta talk about how it affects not just one person, but the whole family. Mm -hmm. and, and then it became this thing where I had to carefully carve away and say, what things do I wanna show on the page? What things do I wanna protect readers from? Especially readers who are fellow suicide loss survivors. Um, you know, I, I'm fully aware that for some people it's going to be too triggering of a book to read. Yeah. And, and others, many, many suicide loss survivors have reached out to me to say that they really needed a book like that. And so I, I think it's, it is a really tricky thing to navigate, to, to figure out like what, what kind of language um, might be poetic but is actually damaging and what, what kind of things are actually important to explore to allow for that safe space. Like when I wasn't given the chance to grieve for my grandfather when I was eight, I found my solace in, in books where, you know, like I read Where the Red Fern Grows and then sobbed my eyes out because it was a, spa a safe space to grieve over the death of these wonderful dogs. And I needed to have that space. So I, I hope that I can offer a safe space 
to somebody who needs something fictional to cry about in order to work out their real life feelings. And Vera. <laughs> I'm thinking also, Vera, that you peel back a window into adults, the, the violence that adults perpetrate on each other yeah. in the full sight of children. Right. And, yeah. Yeah, right. that was very difficult. And, you know, I would hear stories and look at, you know, pictures taken of the time. I mean... Um, there were, you know, trains that were intercepted going in both directions um, where they would be, you know, trains would be stopped by rioters and everybody would get out or get in and there would be this horrible fight and, and then there would be, trains would pull up in stations filled with corpses um, during the partition. So if you talk to anybody who's been through this time and you mention the trains, that's Everybody knows what the trains mean. You just have to say the trains. Um, my father's family got on a train and made it safely over um, the border, but so many people did not. So I had to figure out how I write something for young people to see the truth of this history. I mean, it's a living history still. My, my father's in his 80s, and, and most people, and he was nine when he went through this, so most people who went through um, the partition are in their 80s and 90s and older, and, and then we're not going to have these people alive to tell their stories anymore. So I think people of my generation from partition survivors really uh, feel this urgency. I mean, I definitely felt an urgency to capture this history in the way that I could, and people are doing it in different ways, um, just to make sure to capture it. But the truth of the history is so bloody and so um, unimaginable that, um, you know, I wanted to have some of that truth in the story, but you know, I'm also a parent, and I felt like, um, how, you know, what what can kids handle? And I think that they can handle a lot, but I also didn't want to sort of interrupt the experience of learning about this history, making it too traumatic, because the the raw history is you can't even you can't mm. even process it. Um, and I would sit with tears streaming down my face looking at pictures or feel sick sometimes. Um, but then I would just take that feeling and, and see, you know, how can I kind of match all those things, the truth of the character, the truth of their story, pulling in a number of different stories that I researched. And there was some protection. I mean, I was protecting the young reader at certain times. Um, and I, I think the, you, the, yours is a middle grade novel, yeah, right, as opposed yeah. to YA. I write across sure. those uh, age groups, too. And there are slightly different considerations yes. for each yeah. one. And I think someone at 17 isn't someone at 11, right. right? So we modulate. We have to modulate that. So because I have consideration for you folks, I'm not going to leave you on this sad place. <laughs> so I, I, this is a joyous day, friends, <laughs> right? So I think now we talk fun things. So I am just interested in, um, I, I don't know about you, but what a career this is, right? What a journey. I had no idea when I decided that I wanted to be a writer or try. I really, really had no idea. So I'm curious, like, what has surprised you about being <laughs> an author? What has delighted you? And what has been maybe shocking in not such a good way? <laughs> what do you think? I mean, this could be a free for all. We're gonna, we have access to grind right here, people. No, like, what, what, what do you think? What has delighted you? What has surprised you? Um, so when I was growing up, I honestly thought that you know writers were just like very solo careers, like you know you're just you know you're by yourself. So I've actually been so surprised by how many people I've actually had to talk to, like <laughs> <laughs> like this. <laughs> I'm like, I mean, for, for those who like really know me, like I'm actually like still like quite shy so this is like my worst nightmare but <laughs> but like yeah I'm actually really surprised but also delighted by the fact that I do get to go and you know tour around and go do school visits and talk to kids and you know kids they'll, they'll keep you humble like mm. they, you know yeah you know, bless their hearts 
But yeah, I've always been like, I'm so surprised by how many people I got to talk to and how many uh, kids I got to talk to, how many prisons I've got a chance to visit and like the young men in there and like talking to them and hearing their stories. Um, Cause I honestly, by now, I th really thought I was gonna be like the old woman by the sea. Like I really just was like, I was, I had my shack ready. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I had to talk to anyone. I definitely didn't think I had to be on Twitter and like have to like interact and just, you know, it's just like, pe like I don't really do people. So it was, <laughs> so that has been like, you know, a joyous surprise, I would say. <laughs> what surprised you, Miss Debut? Tell me, what has surprised you? I, I'm perpetually surprised all over again when I'm signing books and an Asian American reader comes up to me and says, I didn't realize we could do this. And, and says that like, you're the first Asian author I've ever met. And every single time I'm like, bowled over by that. Yeah. And like I've, I did a school visit um, at my own middle school a few months ago. And there was this one Asian American girl who came up to me and was like in tears. And I was like, what, are you okay? Like what's going on? <laughs> and she was like, you're like a writer. You're like the real deal. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> this is like a, 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 a lot. Yeah, and, and that's been like really amazing and also really depressing. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and that's, that's true. That's an interesting thing that yeah. there are surprises that are both really joyous and really sad yeah. in yeah. publishing. Yeah. I was sad to find out how few books um, were written by or about people of color. And, right. and I mean, we're improving every year, but that's a, that's a really sad reality when you look out at our country and see who's here and, and the vibrancy of, of the country. What do you think? And I, I co-sign everything that Tiffany and Emily just said. Um, the other thing that really surprises me though, that I guess I wasn't really prepared for, was how incredibly rewarding and edifying it would be to be part of a community of writers. Mm -hmm. the, the Latinx caucus, as <laughs> Daniel Jose Older calls us, the, the larger community of writers of color, it's, they welcome you with open arms, they make you feel like just another sibling and part of this really, really big family. Um, and <laughs> they're people that you can commiserate about, so commiserate <laughs> with about these very things, right? Um, so it's really nice to, to have that network and to have each other's backs and um, to go into, you know, to be on, on a panel, or whatever, and see one of your friends in the audience and know that, that, that there's that solidarity and that. that's something really special. Yeah, it is a nice surprise. I've found that it just being um, welcomed in so many writing communities, and particularly with this book in the South Asian writing community. I think that that has been incredibly joyous for me, and in some ways healing, because I wasn't sure if I was like allowed being half Indian, you know? And so that halfness um, has been, been hard for me to figure out, and then I've just been so, welcomed and, and validated and and I just feel like it's it's okay to be me. And so that has been oh, really surprising and wonderful. Yeah. I've enjoyed um, the honor of just being with people who live in their imagination. Yeah. There's a, a beautiful gift in that. Yeah. Um, in working with adults who still live in the world of, of pretend and what if and who can still remember so clearly what it is to be a child. I love that. And I'm getting ready to wrap up, and what I want to say to all of you is this, that it has been such an honor to be on this stage with you. And I'm so excited to be writing books in the time of Tiffany and Emily and David and Vera. And I just can't wait to see what else you have inside of you. So if there are, I think we're ready. Oh, if we have questions, we can um, ask them now. There's I see one over here. Would you be willing to stand up and give us your question? <laughs> Go ahead. Uh huh. How did you feel when you were writing the books? Anyone want to feel that one? My book is a sad book, so 
I mean, you were. I mean, I, I cried on every every draft. <laughs> I'm also just like like prone to crying, but yeah. yeah. Um, I was a little excited because this was. I mean, I, you know, other than like you know messing with people's heads, which you know that's exciting. Um, <laughs> I think I was really excited because this book takes place like here in DC, which is very much my second home. And so I was excited to bring a lot of DC subculture to the page. Like I was talking to like, I was talking about go-go music, which a lot of people don't know. And I was, I got a chance to like use DC slang. So I was calling people Bamas. That's like a career <laughs> high. And, like, and you know, I was telling people about chicken and mambo sauce. So it was like really like, that was a high for me to, actually how many people are here from Southeast DC? Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, hey guys. <laughs> So at the end of the day, like I was writing for them. I was writing for kids to see themselves on the page too. And you know, I, even though I'm not from here, I love it here as well too. Yeah. Um, so that was actually one of the best things, how I felt, it was amazing. But you went to school here, you went to Yes, Howard, yes, so you, you know, so I, I, I technically, I'm sort of from here, but sort of. Where but, are you from before here? I'm Brooklyn. Ah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants we're, to own we're Brooklyn. So, we're I'm so a queen girl, <laughs> and we don't get enough love. I'm just saying, blushing. <laughs> you see, nobody. <laughs> I tried to like reel it in, but it was too late. <laughs> Other questions? Other questions? Anyone else? Yes. Stand up and, and give it. Oh, this group is lively. Oh God. <laughs> How do we end books? That's a chuffy. <laughs> I, I just, noticed I just she stopped. picked you. <laughs> like, that's enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> Quick epigraph, real short poem, boom, let's go. Well, well, well let like me ask you this. I'm going to piggyback yeah. on yours. Did, is the ending that we read in the actual book, it, was that your first ending? Is that how you originally ended it? No. No, no. Right. It, endings are so hard. I mean, the first one tends to be that sort of wrap it up and stop. I just have to stop. Um, <laughs> and then you just kind of go back again and again. It's, it's so hard to get right. I, I really struggle with endings. Yeah. Um, While Tiffany's like, knife, rent. You <laughs> <laughs> look terrible up here. Gee, you should put her in your novel. You need a character That's named Tiffany, Emily. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> so both of my books um, are loosely inspired by real cases. So Monday's Not Coming was inspired by two real cases oh, um, of happenings that happened. And particularly if you're from DC, you remember the Benita Jacks case. That was very much something that happened here um, only, oh, only a decade ago. So the endings are sort of already, are, I already have them. Like when people are like, you know, how do you come up with these crazy books? I'm like, actually, here's the article. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not making up anything. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's where I sort of come to the conclusions of like the endings of books is like using the real, using the real cases and trying to find a way to make sense of the trauma and make sense of the tragedy by laying out as much causes and effects of how things happen. Because um, I want you guys particularly to realize like everything, you know, no one is born bad. Everyone is grown and developed out of something. And I want you to see all those elements. I want you to see how gentrification, how the crack epidemic, how poverty, how everything actually affects how someone grows and then their and their choices that they eventually make. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Any other questions? There's one really um, there far one in the back by the in camera. The middle? Where? You see it by the camera? Oh. Yes. Uh, my question is directed. Put the mic up. Thank you. <laughs> my question is directed toward Tiffany. Is there a specific reason why um, you chose to talk about Monday being a child who was being abused by her family? Because that actually happened to the girls in the inspired stories. 
So that was the real reason why I chose to talk about that trauma and talk about where that trauma root was rooted from as well too. Okay. One more. There's some girls way in the back by the camera. Way in the back in the white? Yeah, I, I, I actually uh -oh. eventually will need glasses. Okay. Whoever stood up first gets to ask. <laughs> That's the way it works. Throw it to her. Oh my God. <laughs> um, hi, um, I was wondering for Miss Emily, um, how did your family react to you talking about the trauma that you went through um, when you were younger Ooh. in the book? How did they react to your books in general? That's a good so one. my, <laughs> my parents haven't finished reading yet. And, that is hilarious. And so, but I did, I did sit down, sit down with them when we sold the book <laughs> to be like, this is coming out. <laughs> you can't do anything about it. What's um, up? I, I sort of feel like, um, my family is maybe a little, I'm like, are they watching this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are I, live streaming. I, I think my family is probably a little unprepared for how honest I like to be in my work. You know, like one time I wrote a short story about someone with bad breath and my mom was like, people are gonna think you have bad breath. <laughs> if she only knew that that's the <laughs> smallest problem. And, and so, but I did, I did feel I wanted to be respectful. So I did reach out to my cousins and I did reach out to my parents and say, this is, this is something I'm writing about. And, and I know that you feel very trapped by the stigma and you don't want people to know that there's depression in our family and you don't, you don't want people to see us in that, that light that you cast upon this entire topic and, and I want to be able to talk about it. And so it started with this, you know, like growing up my, my parents were always like, don't let people know that there's depression in your family um, because they'll look at you differently. And, and I always really pushed against that. I always felt like it was something that we needed to, you know, like depression, any mental illness, it's a, it's a health problem, you know? Like somebody who has diabetes needs insulin, maybe someone who has depression needs more serotonin. And so we need to talk about these things the same way we can talk about other health issues mm -hmm. so that the stigma doesn't cause people to do more damage to themselves, to, to feel like they have to hide and they can't, live out there freely. And so, so I've always been more vocal than my family wanted me to be about it. And then when I wrote this book, I, I had to sort of sit my parents down and be like, how much are you willing to let me talk about? And that's been one of the amazing gifts of this journey is that my parents have started to open up more oh, about it. Nice. Yeah, nice. And, and, yeah, and my mom has said to me too that like one day I also wanna write about our family. Like it is a goal. Oh, my mom yeah. is also a writer. And <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. yeah. So that's been, my mom is a creative nonfiction writer so I feel like through her lens it would be, it would be like really especially important. And um, so yeah, I mean, it's a great question. It's complicated. They, we'll see, I'll, I'll report back to you when they actually finish the book. We, we want the transcripts of the calls. With your <laughs> um, all right, if we can give these wonderful <laughs> When we selected the topic, read, discover, grow, we had no idea how much we would grow in such a short time. Thank you again, all of you. I took so many notes, um, the nuanced stories of our communities, uh, the challenges of perpetuating stereotypes or telling the truth. Uh, I, I just could go on forever, and I just, I mean, I think this has just been such a, a wonderful symposium, and I, I really want to thank the Library of Congress for partnering with us and, and, and bringing um, your voices, your wonderful voices, and also uh, bringing in adults, students, educators, librarians, and, um, and, and you, you guys, especially the students, ask such wonderful questions. Yeah.